worship with us. We've been going through the book of Ephesians in a series that's been entitled <clears throat> Finding Our Purpose in Our Identity in Christ's Grace. And we've been talking about what it means for us to be the church, to be this people that God has used to fill the whole earth with his presence. That's the call of the church. And so we've been talking about what it means for us to respond to Christ's love and to Christ's grace, to God's action in the world. What does that look like in our lives? What does that look like in the church? How do we live out what it means for us to live out, to be the light in the world? Christ's body. So we have to walk in the way of love. We have to submit to one another humbly in love. And God has given us this thing that runs so countercultural to the world in which we live. Because we live in a very me-centered world, an individualistic world, a world that says it is about power and it is about control. But to take on the image of Christ means to let go of all of those things. To take on the image of Christ means to do something so radical and so countercultural that it might actually make a difference in the world for the sake of the kingdom. For Paul calls us, and the scriptures call us, and Jesus calls us to submit to one another. We open our Bibles this morning to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. <laughs> Finishing up chapter 5 this morning, we begin in verse 21, reading to verse 33. Here now the reading of God's holy word. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, sum submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and not to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed it, and they care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray today that you would write your word on our hearts. We pray today that we would submit to you and submit to one another, that we would surrender. In the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. A couple weeks ago, Laura and I were at a family reunion with our kids at my dad's family cottage out on Lake Milton in Ohio, and my four-year-old was being his normal, wonderful, energetic, and very stubborn self. I don't even remember what it was that we were, uh, that I was annoyed about or arguing about with him at the moment that seems to happen to us a lot. Now, I say that in total love for my son because, as I've told you many times, he is just like me. And so I gotta just get a taste of my own medicine, I think, in a way. I also think that God has made four-year-olds and two-year-olds incredibly cute and adorable so that they live. <laughs> As we were arguing about something that probably didn't matter and was irrelevant, my dad's cousin leans over to me and she says, oh, just enjoy these moments. <laughs> to which I did this. I had this look on my face of uh, like, what? <laughs> now she sees my face of annoyance and confusion like, here, you take him then and you figure this out. And uh, she, then she continues and she says, this is the most control you're ever going to have. To which I made this face. Uh, like, I am just going to, you know, we're going to fight about this lady. Uh, there was a part of me that just, I think after she saw that face, she went, 
I think I'm going to step out of this one for a moment. You know, in parenting, so often, we end up in a battle of the will. It, it is a battle for control. And we're not at a point, we have a four and two year old, and we have to create this, this structure for them. And sometimes that gets really difficult. I was talking to a friend of mine this week, he has a three year old, and he said, Everything in my life right now is a fight. Put on clothes, it's a fight. Eat, it's a fight. Whatever it might be, it is a fight. To which I laughed, and I just responded, Parenting is hard, man. Just get over it. This is so much of our lives. As parents, so much of it is filled with awe and joy and wonder. The good moments far, far outweigh the bad. But more than so often, we end up in this battle for control. And I think that that's just part of human nature. And I think that it doesn't go away as the kids get older. I, I'm not like thinking that somewhere down the line, I think parents just eventually give up. They just say, okay, you're on your own. I'm out of it. I'm not doing this anymore. Because so much of our lives and so much of who we are is a fight for control. That we want to control who we are. We want to walk our own path. We want to control our destiny. We want to control all of the outcomes. I think it's human nature. I think it's human instinct. And the idea that we have to submit to something or to someone else from the very beginning, as I'm experiencing right now as a parent of a two and four year old, the very beginning is a fight for control. Which does not bode well for me because I like to be in control. You see, we live in a culture that really feeds this individualistic mindset. We hear these words all the time, that you are the master of your own destiny, that you get to write your own story, that all of this, all of it, is under your control, and that you get to control the outcomes and what other people are going to do and be. But specifically, for yourself. And this idea that we have to submit to something or someone, that just makes us uncomfortable, especially as Americans, because one of the great values that we hold as Americans is individualistic control. And we hold on to that value so dearly that we'll fight for it. And so when someone or something comes along and tells us that we have to submit, because that word submit to us means to yield to another, to yield to another's power and authority. The whole American concept, the whole American ideal is I am, you don't get to tell me what to do. Now as a culture, that's worked really well for us. But how has that invaded the church and how we understand our role together as the body of Christ? What does it look like for us to say that we submit to one another? Because that word submit, that idea that we yield to another, that someone else or something else has power and authority over us makes us uncomfortable. A bit squeamish. Because we understand submission as a one-way street. From the bottom up, I submit to a power or authority that is greater than I. And so when we read Ephesians 5, especially the bottom of it, it makes us a little uncomfortable. It does. For a couple reasons. One, this passage has been used, I think, incorrectly for generations, for some, to subjugate women to men. That's the number one reason why I think, by the way, this makes us uncomfortable. I was in a counseling session a few years ago with somebody who was being uh, verbally and emotionally abused by her husband. And she said, well, she quoted this passage for me. She said, well, he's the head of the house, and I have to take it. I went, oh, I think you missed it. Many in our culture and our world have used the, the back end of Ephesians 5 to say that a little reading of the Bible proves, and from Ephesians 5, that, that, America, or that Christianity itself is incompatible with American ethics and how we understand the household to function. And so part of that, as a pastor, I'm just going to let you into our mindset a little bit. You sort of want to go, ah, can we skip this verse so people don't get uncomfortable? But if you commit to read through a book of the Bible, you have to take the whole thing, right? You don't get to pick and choose the pieces that you like or don't like or the pieces that 
make you a little bit uncomfortable. But I also think that we have a huge misunderstanding of what the text is calling us to. Because we have to put it all in context of what we've seen throughout Ephesians, which is this. You are the body of Christ. You. And you have a responsibility to live as the light of the Lord out in the world. You have a responsibility to walk in the way of love. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. And on the heels of that, Paul actually writes something that is incredibly radical. He writes these words in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It is radical because no one in the first century, no one in the Roman world or in the Jewish world, would have written these words that men have a responsibility to submit to their wives. No one. Submit to one another. And so as we read the rest of the passage, we have to hold that verse as our introductory verse this morning. We have to hold that verse in our minds. Submit to one another. Because then Paul goes on to these two very distinct roles that, one, give us somewhat of a framework for a household code, but two, tells us more about our relationship to one another and to Jesus than anything else. And so the second thing that he says after he says submit to one another is wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, this would probably be incompatible with our mindset if it said, wives, bow down and worship your husbands as you do Jesus. Now, the guys are sort of going like, yeah, that would be nice if we had that, that way of thinking. See, this is where this passage has gotten misused. Because if you just read 22 to 24, and you're a man, and you go, yeah, I could get on board with this way of thinking. Submit to, submit to one another. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the uh, husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And so when we read those words, we can get into this mindset of saying, okay, the husband is the head, Christ is the authority of the church, and so the husband must be authority over the wife. But notice that, that Paul does not use the words authority. He uses Christ as the example. Christ and his church are the example of a relationship. This passage is not about subjection. It's not about authority. It's not about power. And how do we know that? Because husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And how does Christ love the church? But to lay down his life for her. This way of thinking in the first century, and even today, in the world of individualism, is a radical understanding of the marriage relationship. Radical. How does Christ love the church? But to lay down his life and surrender to the cross so that the church might be held up as a holy and radiant bride. See, in this image that Paul lays out for us, Jesus surrenders. The God of all the universe does not come down to the world to seek power and authority. But he lays down his life That we, that we might be forgiven. And so as we continue in that image, this mystery that Paul lays out for us, we're willing to surrender to Jesus. Why? We're willing to submit to Jesus. Why is that? Why are we willing to do that? It's that old adage that we love because he first loved us. We're willing to surrender and to submit to Jesus because we know that Jesus 
did not seek power and authority. He didn't stay on his heavenly throne in the world above, but he came down to this earth and went to the cross for us, that he gave up it all, all for us. And so we respond. Wives, love your husbands. Submit to them. As to the Lord, but husbands, submit to your wife. Surrender to sacrifice. That's what Jesus does for us. We respond to Christ. Because he showed his great love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. And so this job that is given, this, this shocking, radical concept that's given to the husband is, husband, lay down your life. Not about power or authority, but about love. Sacrifice. To hold up your bride as radiant and holy. Lay down your life. And when you do, you submit to her. You give up yourself. You put her first in all things. And when you do, you bear the image of Jesus. That she might be, no matter what, no matter what she's done, no matter who she is, no matter whatever it might be that you hold there, that you are willing to sacrifice. That's the call that Christ puts on us. That's the call that Paul puts on us. And it is radical to love your wife the way that Christ loves the church. It means that you're willing to surrender. And it's not about weakness. You see, it's easy to hold on to control. It's easier at least than it is to surrender. You know, there's this weird thing here in Western Pennsylvania. By the way, I've never seen it anywhere else. But all the way around here, there are all these one-lane bridges. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. You know what's fascinating to me about the one-lane bridges around here? There's a yield sign on both sides. Nobody has the right way. And we've all experienced that person that sort of got on the bumper of the other car and snuck through, and you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> you, you're so selfish. You didn't, you didn't yield. You didn't surrender. It was my turn. And I think that's such a wonderful image for us of what Paul is explaining here in Ephesians 5. Mutual submission. Mutual surrender. A yield on both sides of the bridge. See, we've used this passage for generations to say that, that men are here in this sort of this hierarchical structure and we have this top down in the household code, but to do that means you erase verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Because in this image, what Paul is saying is give your lives to another and it's mutual submission, not just in marriage, but in community together. You, to one another. Submit it means to surrender, to let go, to trust that that other person going to care and love and have grace. This passage is about mutual, humble submission to each other in the image of what Christ has done for us. 
And so today, as we prepare to come to this table, we need no other analogy. We need no other story. For this table in and of itself is a picture of what Christ has done for us. That he surrendered to the cross. That we might receive his love and grace. That we might be held up as a radiant bride before the holy throne of God. May this table today as we come here be a sign and a symbol of what God has done for us. May it be a reminder of the call that's been placed on each and every single one of us to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. May this table, as we gather around it as the church, be a reminder that the head of the church is body. up all that we might have life. Friends, the head needs the body. And we, as the body of Christ, are called to fill the whole earth with his presence. The head needs the body, and the body needs the head. This picture is a picture of unity, of common union. Together. Surrender. Submit. Give your life to Him that you can be part of His body, called to go and fill the whole earth with His presence. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to come to this table, may we stand together and sing. Let us break bread together on our knees.